get Elvis impersonators or something. She said, no, we're going to do something really cool. And tonight's speaker is no exception. Uh, Dr. Steve Lundblad is the chair and professor of the geology department of the University of Hawaii, Hilo. Uh, he grew up in Yakima, Washington. So that's in central Washington on the dry side of the Cascades, right? Yeah. I got that right. Um, he said, I don't think I knew this at the time, but in retrospect, I think part of the reason why I'm a geologist is I was in high school when Mount St. Helens erupted about 100 miles away. Our town got completely buried by volcanic debris. So, yeah, that would have an influence on it. Um, that caused him to want to get his undergrad at Harvard University in Geology in 85, his master's in Geology in 88 from the University of Wisconsin, and then his PhD in Geology in 1994, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. As far as his work goes, he's been a professor of geology at U of H Hilo, 2007 to the present. Do I have some of his students in the house? Woo! There we go. Tell me these aren't sucking up to the professor. Um, he, was a, he was the recipient of the 2018 U of H Board of Regents Excellence in Teaching Award. How cool is that? about that, he said his proudest moment is when he gets to hear from his former students, and he knows they've done something really fantastic for them. He said, I feel that's why I do this. I'm here to help my students learn things, learn new skills, set themselves up to really go accomplish stuff, and hopefully do things that are meaningful in not only their lives, but meaningful for all of us. And I think that's a great way to introduce Dr. Steve. All right, well, good evening, everyone, and, and I will say that I, I guess after, I don't know who wrote all that, but, you know, um, uh, that, that one of the people that has done some really great stuff is Katie Mulliken, who's put together the Volcano Awareness Month um, things, and she's clearly given us a lot of good things to do. So a big round for Katie. Um, I have to stand closer to the mic or maybe make it a little taller. Would that help? Does that help? Okay, um, I don't usually do this, I usually just shout at people, so it's easier. Um, a lot of good talks, and I'll just highlight for those of you guys that are going to be down in Hilo tomorrow night, Kendra um, Lynn is going to talk on our campus about some of the geochemical work that we do in collaboration with the HVO folks down there. So if you're down in town uh, tomorrow night, that's great. And then Liz is going to give a field trip on Saturday um, out at Mauna Ulu. Um, so there's another UH connection for you guys to do that. Uh-oh. I've already broken it. Here we go. No? What happened? What did we do? Hang on. What happened? Here, we'll just start. I thought I was all ready to go. Um, and now I'm not. Here we go. Let's go up here. This is why I want a teaching award, in case you're wondering. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's start with this. Um, ah, that's better. Okay, yay! What I'd like to do tonight is talk a little bit about some of the eruptions that are up around the summit of Kilauea. And I know some of you guys were probably here last week to listen to Matt Patrick talk about some of the more recent eruptions, and he had all the fun stuff. He had the videos and the nice photos and all of, the, all of that. So um, we're going to talk about some of the eruptions around the summit, some of the summit ones, um, and talk a little bit about what might happen in the future. And I can make stuff up as well as anybody can, so we'll see if we can come up with some things. A little reminder for if, you, if you're not in tune completely to some of the chronology here. Um, currently, we're at, a, we're at a time when we have some eruptions happening up in the caldera. And we're kind of in a pause right now. We've had a few eruptions this, this past year. I guess it's 2024 already. Um, over the last few years. Um, so we'll show a couple pictures of that. We had the big eruption in the Lower East Drift Zone, unfortunately, in 2018 with uh, the caldera, partial caldera collapse up here. Um, some other things going on with the lava lake up at the summit. Uh, but then, you know, the recent past, uh, 
has been dominated by uh, the eruption out on the East Rift in, at Pu'u'u. And, you know, that eruption went on for 35 years. And so I think for a lot of us, um, that's what we think of when we think about the Kilauea erupting. Uh, maybe we have short memories and we've forgotten about it already, but, you know, that went on for so long that most people's impression of, of what has gone on at this volcano is that eruption. And so what I want to do is talk a little bit about some of the things that went on before that, kind of in the 60s, um, and that's at the summit and, and around uh, the summit area. So we'll just take a few quick uh, shots of, of some of the recent activity here. Uh, on the left, this is the lava lake from, uh, from the January eruption. Um, before that, there was a lava lake before the collapse, and that's, that's the picture on the right, just to remind everybody what the caldera used to look like. Um, and it was very cute back then, a tiny little, <laughs> little thing in there with, the, with Holly Mountain Mountain. Um, so much of that uh, downdrop, uh, collapsed part of the caldera uh, has been filled in with new lava flows. And uh, we, we had a nice pattern going where we had lavas, lava flows every three months. And so I by the time I gave this talk, we'd have another one. And we haven't yet. Um, but what, one of the things I want to talk about tonight is some of the information that leads us to believe that we're getting maybe closer uh, to having another eruption at the summit. So if we go back a little bit further, we can talk about a little bit uh, all of the uh, lava that erupted uh, in the Lower East Rift Zone in Leilani Estates. Uh, these are the big lava chains. The, uh, the collapse that went along with that up here. So just a reminder um, that uh, the volume of lava that came out in the Lower East Rift Zone is less about the same as the of collapse up here at the summit. So draining the magma chamber at the summit, not completely, but draining partially, and having that magma go down the Lower East Drift and then erupt as a series of lava flows. And that was, that kind of punctuated the end of the Pu'u'u. And in fact, the day, uh, you know, there was one final little eruption out of Pu'u'u on, I think it was April 30th, if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, um, in 2018. Uh, and then uh, a few days later, we had that eruption down in Lower Puna. So these are a couple photos from early on in that eruption. And like many Hawaiian eruptions, of a fissure eruption out in the forest, uh, followed by the building of the cone. And then over the course of uh, 35 years, uh, that cone changed and the lava flows changed a lot. Um, I think there were 61 different episodes that the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory folks uh, defined for that eruption. So that was a very long live eruption, kind of unusual because it was not at the summit to be erupting for so long. And then if we go back a little bit farther, I think um, folks are pretty familiar with uh, the Mauna Ulu eruption, again, Liz is going to be telling us everything about that on Saturday. Um, but uh, that eruption is the one that you see when you drive near the coast on Chain of Craters Road. Um, you can see Mauna Ulu if you drive out the, to the parking area out there. There's really some fabulous stuff to see. Uh, but if we go back a little bit further, we had some short eruptions out in some different places. And so... Uh, this was an eruption in 1971, uh, a couple days, I think, uh, up near the summit, uh, and then uh, just a very brief period of time out on the southwest drift zone. I'm not completely sure, but I think the, the ranger on the horse is smoking a pipe in this photo, just which is, <laughs> things have changed a little bit in the last uh, 50 years or so. Um, uh, and then there, uh, another series of eruptions in 1974. Um, uh, the one that you see if you've hiked out by the devastation trail out to see the glow of the lava at some point um, along the old road around the, the Crater Rim Drive. Uh, some of those lava flows are from 1974. 1974 crosses the chain of Craters Road uh, down by Luamanu. Uh, out in the southwest drift zone. And another fairly short-lived uh, series of lava flows. 
And then I just have this chart up, and it's not an extensive list. I mean, it's not uh, an exhaustive list of eruptions in various places uh, at Kilauea um, in the 60s and 70s. And so I guess the only point I'm really trying to make here uh, is these were all relatively short-lived eruptions, and they were in a variety of different places. And I guess one of the other things to just note here is if you notice where we are, and I have the laser pointer that's going to be a little bright, but that's okay. Um, so in this 1982 eruption, whoa, I told you. Uh, you know, here's the old uh, crater rim drive. I'll try not to keep it on very long. Um, that lava flow crossed the road. Um, in the 1973 eruption up here in the upper left, it crossed the chain of Craters Road. If we go back a slide for uh, that 1974 lava flow crossed the chain of Craters Road. So that's, that's kind of one of the points here, is that we have relatively short-lived eruptions uh, in various places near the crater. Uh, some of them are out on the East Rift Zone as well, but uh, relatively short-lived and um, in a variety of locations. So what does that mean for us today, and what does that mean for us moving forward with the, with the volcano? And so what I'd like to focus a little bit of, on here um, is talking about kind of structural control on where the lava flows go. So um, if you think about it, lava, like water, flow downhill. And it would like to take a path to go from a high area to a low area. So this is, uh, I think, a great photo from the USGS folks um, of the early stages of the collapse up at, uh, up on the caldera floor. And again, for those of you that have been around long enough, you'll recognize that there's a lot next to Holly Mountain Mountain. And that parking lot is now, at least part of it, you know, down that you can, on a block you can see partway down, and the rest of it is now buried with lava down in the bottom of the big hole. So this significantly larger over the course of the summer in 2018. And so that's the area that's now been filling in with new lava flows, right? And they are in there because the eruption is starting there, and the only way that that lava is going to get out is if it fills the entire space and then can work its way out, work its way out from there. So that's a, that's a pretty, I think, pretty straightforward discussion of how things go. We need to take a little bit of a detour here for a minute, though, um, and, and talk a little bit about the fact that maybe the longer-term history of, of the Kilauea volcano and, and recognize that uh, it goes through periods of explosive volcanism in addition to go periods of kind of effusive volcanism, so big lava flows or different types of lava flows like we're experiencing today. Uh, and at other times, not so many lava flows and much more kind of explosive volcanism. So this is a picture of Nathan out next to uh, some of these explosive deposits uh, that are in an area south of the caldera. And these Kanakakoi um, deposits in some places are up to 14 meters thick. So a lot of explosive volcanism, and much of this was emplaced uh, in this time period from about 500 years ago to about 200 years ago. So over that time, lots of explosive volcanism at the volcano. So why are we talking about that if we're going to worry about lava flows? Well, the big thing here uh, is that these explosive episodes probably begin with some sort of caldera forming eruption. So we think the caldera at Kilauea may be 500 years old, or a little longer than that. Uh, but before that, it was a big shield volcano that had the capacity to send lava flows straight down off of the, from the summit, more or less. So if we look today, what we see is that there are some barriers even before the, the most recent collapse up at the caldera. So if you're on the north side of the Caldera, right? It's about 400 feet down uh, to the caldera floor. 
Maybe it's another 400 feet down to where the top of the lava lake is. On the south side, because we're moving away from the summit, there are also some barriers out there. And they don't look like a whole lot, but they're enough that you would have to build the lava flow high enough to be able to then go further down. Slope from there. So the fact that there's a big hole, you've got to fill the hole up before you can send the lava out further to the south. Right? I mean, uh, and so uh, in order to have lava flow south of the caldera in any volume, uh, they probably occurred before the caldera collapsed. That's kind of the point. That's, our, that's why we want to, want to kind of think about that. It was really a nice day. I just took a screen capture of the HBO webcam. When was that? A couple days ago. It was super sunny. So what I, I guess what we're talking about here is if, if we have some sort of cartoon cross-section from the summit of Kilauea off to the south down to the ocean, um, you can see that eruption that occurs at or near the summit here, and I might press my luck with the green laser pointer again, right? Here, um, there's a lot of topography to deal with in order to send lava flows out there. So one way to think of this is that those era areas that are south of the, of the summit are kind of protected by the topography of the caldera. And so one of the things that I'd like to kind of talk to you a little bit about tonight um, is this Kauai fault system and the fact that it is, I think, exerting some influence on what happens not only with surface lava flows, but also magma that is moving below the ground away from the summit of the volcano. So we're going to look at some pieces of information um, that, that tell us how that interaction is occurring. Um, and try to see what that might mean for where we might think that we're going to find an eruption at some point in the future. All right. Um, many that that there is a uh, kind of a lava zone hazard map that exists for the island of Hawaii. And, uh, basically, it runs from one through nine. One is in, which generally means you know, it's a little more likely. So that's kind of the extreme risk. Um, and nine is kind of the lowest risk, at least on our island, right? Um, and so if you're up in the northern part of our island, if you're in, in, in the Kohalas, uh, the last eruptions there were a long time ago. Uh, and so the, the chance that you're going to get overrun by a lava flow is very low. Um, if you are right near the rift, of one of the volcanoes, either the east rift or the southwest rift of Kilauea, or one of the rifts of Mauna Loa, or downhill from that, uh, your risk is a lot higher of being run over by a lava flow. And unfortunately, we found that out in 2018 when the lava flow started from the east rift zone out near Pahoa. I guess what I'd like you to see on this, and, and it's one of the things that kind of intrigues me about when I first um, is that there are these places below the summits of Mauna Loa and Kilauea that, are, that don't seem to fit very well. So there's a zone five that's just a few miles from here. And there's a zone six that's below the summit of, of Mauna Loa. And it has to do with the geometry of the caldera. So it's stopping the lava flows from going that direction. And it just means that this is a place where it's been a long time since we've seen lava fl active lava flows. So that's kind of one of the, the kind of the thought things about, about this that is, that I think is driving. So the question is, what, what's going on there? What can we say about that? And where might we expect to see some, some future eruptions? OK, and, and this is a, a map that, that uh, is a, uh, it's kind of uh, built from a LIDAR, set of LIDAR images um, from our friends in, in Geneva, University of Geneva who are working on this Kauai fault system, uh, which is this connector between the, and again, we're going to, I said I wasn't going to, but I lied, uh, the southwest rift zone of Kilauea, the east rift zone out here, 
And the Coy fault system basically connects those two uh, rifts with the, whoa, with the series of normal faults. Okay. Um, I think that controls a lot of what happens in the subsurface uh, with magma when it, inter when it leaves the, the summit area of Kilauea. And a lot of other people think that too. This is not, not anything that I've dreamed up. Uh, but I'm going to show you some information specifically about how that works. Uh, the other thing, reason why this is, I think, a great diagram to show uh, is that all of those numbers represent ages of the lava flows that are out there. And so if you notice, uh, they're on the order of 650 to 700 years old. So it's not 10 years or 20 years or 50 years or 75 years. Um, they're, they're quite old, and there really aren't any new lava flows out there. All lava flows are somewhere out near the southwest drift zone or out along what's called the east drift connector or the east drift zone. We're going on either side of that, and that area is fairly protected from lava flows. Now, one of the nice things about this that it allows us to actually study those faults in some detail because they don't keep getting buried by lava flows. There are plenty of cracks that exist out in the zone, cracks that exist out in the southwest drift zone, but they keep getting buried by these pesky And so it's harder to study what's happening there, right? So this is a fantastic place um, to, to look at. Um, so it, the, the, the faults connect the south, they merge into the southwest drift zone over here into the Kamakai Hills. Uh, they merge into the east drift zone. Um, they're pretty active faults. Uh, my students and I, after the 2018 eruption, measured some places where the faults moved about 40 centimeters vertically, which is what? 15 inches something like that, 18 inches, I don't know. Um, and, uh, and I think, and, and the, the key point for tonight, right, is that, they're, that they seem to control the magma movement and therefore might control a little bit where we expect to see some of these lava flows come out. So we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at, at some of these faults uh, that are out in there. So a couple things uh, from, from this, uh, two pictures. One, you can see those lava flows look old. It's brown and they have a bunch of trees on them. And uh, it's a pretty beautiful part of the park, really. Uh, the other thing you can see, I hope, uh, in this left picture in particular, um, is there's a big cliff out there. And that cliff is one of these faults. And so the lava flow that all of the students are standing on, I think I'm in that picture too somewhere, um, is the same lava flow that's on the cliff on the other side. And they've been offset over the years, over at least the last 650 or 700 years, um, so that they're now not coincident with one another anymore. Places uh, where those um, Lava flows have been displaced by probably about 50 feet in 650 or 700 years. So these are pretty active faults. They move, they move pretty regularly. And they move a lot in these big events like we had in 2018. Um, there, like I said, there's a lot of displacement on some of these faults. So here are some of the students. We're, we're trying to measure uh, vertical change, so we're measuring elevation differences, basically, and then how those elevation differences change over time. Uh, those rods are three meters or 10 feet long. So that's a, big, that's a big crack. We don't generally go zip lining across those things. Um, it does require some work to try to figure out the right path to work our way around um, all these things. Uh, but but these, these faults are still moving. That's the, that's the thing. So one of the, one of the nice things that happened, and um, you'll, you'll hear this name again, so Don Swanson and some of his colleagues at the USGS, in the, starting in the 1960s, 
uh, decided it was a good idea after a series of, after an eruption and a, some earthquakes and a lot of movement out there, uh, to put in a whole bunch of different kind of benchmarks or monuments that they could go back and remeasure. And so this is uh, just kind of, this is a Google Earth image of that particular area. So you can see the Kilauea summit up at the top. You can see the Chain of Craters Road moving down off over there to the right. Um, uh, you can see Mauna actually there on the right edge of the diagram. And then uh, it's hard to see exactly uh, where it is. Um, but the uh, Helena Poly Road basically works its way down. Out, about in there. Uh, and, and the campground uh, that you drive by is right down in there. So, so it kind of cuts across there. And so this is the area that's kind of north of that, mainly north of that Helena Poly Road. So what they did was they put these things in, and this is pre-GPS. So they had to come up with ways to try to figure out how things moved. And so there were a series of different So one is, is a level line, which is just a whole series of quarter-sized uh, stainless steel carriage bolts that are out there that are fixed in the rocks. Uh, those are these three kind of main lines that go uh, mainly north-south. Uh, there's stations which are more densely spaced pins that go across a specific fault. Uh, and then there's a whole series of these that go kind of across the landscape um, that was an EDM network, an electronic distance measure. Right? So again, one of these things where you can just measure the distance between those points. And so they measured stuff old school wise. We used those level rods. We still do that with the students. They're experts um, at this now. Um, and they used a steel tape measure. And they used this electronic distance measure. So today, right? Uh, we can do some different things, but that method, especially for the level lines and the crack stations, is still really one of the more precise ways to measure these things. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of that data uh, moving forward. So here, uh, this is from a, a couple years ago. This is, uh, I think, in 20, 2021. Maybe 20, 2020 and 2021, when when uh, some of the uh, b before the at the at the summit again. Um, so again, seeing some of the the faults out here, um, we're just basically elevation difference on these level rods. We won't get into too many of the details there, um, and we're basically trying to show or, or measure some sort of um, offset when we had some sort of seismic events like we did in 2018. For those of you folks that live up here, you know we had a few earthquakes in 2018. Um, and then more recently, we've been able to track ground deformation of the land moved. When the, when the magma intrudes into the ground, it causes the ground to, to rise. If the magma comes out of, the, out of the ground and leaves it, it tends to contract. So we're, we're looking at some of that uh, inflation and deflation events as well. So this is a graph that shows just position on the x-axis down here, and then kind of how much motion there is relative to some fixed point. And that fixed point in this one is it's this blue set of pins, and it's fixed relative to that northern point, I think. I think that's right. No, it's fixed next to the southern point. I, I knew it was one of them. South on that side, north on the, on the left side. OK. Um, and in a kind of a normal two-year period, when we have gone out to measure this, what we see is that the, the general slope of the land is deflating a little bit to the south, right? It's subsiding to the, to the um, up to the north, right? 
the caldera is deflating, right? And this is moving down a little bit as it, as it goes from south on the right to north on the left. So uh, do I have the years? Yeah, these are just two representative years, 2008 to 2010, 1986 to 1988. Okay, so that's just kind of the amount that that two mile long, essentially, line will subside towards the caldera. And what is it over the course of those two miles it goes down, maybe 10 centimeters, something like that. Well, in 2021, we saw something different. And so what was going on in 2021 in the fall? Well, there's the caldera up there in the, on this diagram or this image on the left and a whole string of earthquakes coming out through what's called that southwest rift zone connector um, down through this series of faults. Okay, so we went out and re-measured that line, and for a two-year period, so from 19, or 2019 to 2021, what we saw instead was not much um, deflation at all, to about halfway, and then just a steady uplift of about 15, 15 and a half centimeters out to the north. So why was the ground inflating out there? It's because we were going up onto this probably fairly planar dike that was intruding down uh, to that part of the volcano. So the dike's intruding, it's causing the land to move up like this, and we're measuring the side of one of those uh, the side of that uplift. So again, I, we can thank the people who were smart enough to put these things uh, a long time ago. We can kind of go back and remeasure them, and gee, that that dike intruded right where we needed to go look at it. So that was, that tells us, okay, all of those earthquakes are probably representing new material, magma coming in and causing the ground surface to rise. A uh, couple other just quick things here. Um, the kind of the squiggly part of that line, especially with the red one, that's moving some of those different faults. That's showing that those faults are actually differentially moving a little bit um, as well. This one's a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's showing kind of what happened to in October. So in October, after the eruption in September, um, another set of earthquakes, which are all those yellow circles, coming down this southwest rift connector in the south caldera. And superimposed on that is a whole series of these kind of uh, rainbow bands. Uh, and that's one of these INSAR images. It's a uh, an interferogram of, from satellites looking at ground uplift. And essentially, the bullseye represents the area in the middle of the uplift, and each one of those fringes represents some amount of uplift. I think it, each fringe in this case is 1.5 centimeters. So that's a, that's a satellite way uh, to get some of this information. So after looking at this, uh, my students and I decided, what a great idea. We'll go out and measure some of these things again. Why, why shouldn't we go out there and do this again? Actually, it's, it, there's a real reason to do it, and it is because there's a whole series of points out here that we could go measure that would give us a lot more detailed information to add to the good work that the folks at HBO are doing. So they have a great picture of what's happening, happening from the satellite, from the earthquakes, but now and from permanent GPS stations. But now we can add to that by having a whole bunch of other stations and really see how the ground is deforming away from that center and how it's maybe interacting with these faults. So that was the goal. I think the actual term that I used when I sent the text out to some of the students was, please be prepared to go for a long hike in all caps. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. A couple of these guys went, and, or a few of these guys went, and it was. It was a long hike for everybody. 
Uh, but what we did was we had measured these guys in March of last year. And then we were able to remeasure the same points as this intrusion was going on uh, in, in October. And so just, just to back up for just a second, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the main information uh, that, that is needed for volcano monitoring and awareness and everything else is done by the HVO folks, and they have a series of instruments that are all across the volcano, and it's fabulous. So they have these permanent GPS stations. Here are three different uh, locations, Byron's Ledge, um, coupled that are down south of the caldera. And I just put these things on the side over here. Those arrows just represent different amounts, so they're not all at the same scale, just so that you're not too worried about that. But this is the amount of vertical motion on those GPS stations over the last couple of years. And so I've got a couple lines superimposed on this. The, the two red ones um, are when the eruptions happened uh, in the fall and the summer. And you can see how inflation before the eruption causing those stations to move up. And then when the eruption occurred, right, and magma's coming out of the ground, as lava flows, then it, it, we get deflation in those places. So there's a fairly abrupt decrease uh, for each one of those. And we were fortunate uh, that we had measured um, our kinematic GPS uh, elevations back there in March, and then we did them again out there in October. So that's kind of what we, what we did, what we looked at, and it's kind of to augment this existing network of, of really great pieces of information uh, that are out there as well. So here are some of the students. Here's Tegan, who graduated last spring, and she's now off uh, at Western Washington. Um, and here's Paige and, and Anna, who was uh, an exchange student. We try to get everybody to come out, whether they know what they're doing or not. She's like, come on out, it'll be fun. It's going to be a hike. It'll be great. Uh, you know, and I think she still spoke to me after this, which was, which was good. Uh, but so what we have are we have some of these um, uh, GPS units that are a little better than the ones that they are in your phone um, and a little better than the handheld ones. Um, and so we can go around and looking for these small monuments out across the landscape uh, and trying to measure elevation difference between these two measuring events. And so just, you know, here are a couple of our graduates. Here's Alice and, and Audrea, who graduated a couple years ago. We've managed to have some folks give some presentations on, on some of this information. Here they are out measuring. I don't know that it's these two. Here's some folks out measuring, um, again, some of these uh, points out uh, in, the, in the cracks. So here's what we found. And this doesn't look super exciting yet, but that's OK. Wait for it. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is the elevation difference between March and October. And so the green, you know, the, the black numbers are elevation increases or the ground rows, and the red ones are a little bit of ground deformation or uh, de deflation. That's the word we're looking for, I think. Um, and I just would like to point out that those are all pretty small. All the red numbers are pretty small. I'm still not sure what happened at that one on the left. Um, and, and the error on these instruments, it's not as precise as those permanent nice stations that, that, are, that are out there. So our error is maybe a centimeter or so. So essentially, to me, all those numbers kind of mean not a lot of motion, really. Maybe a little bit of deflation. But I think that these numbers that are off further to the north are real. So 10 or 15 or 20 centimeters of uplift, 30 centimeters of uplift. And if you think about it, you go, wait a minute, that can't possibly be right. Can that be right? Well, let's go back to the, to the, to the permanent GPS stations for a second, wherever they went. Here we go. Well, just in the last, in that period of time from, now granted it's moved up a lot in the last couple months, 
but it's, you know, this, this middle uh, GPS station, the ground has inflated by essentially 35 centimeters since last summer or last year at this time. So, yeah, that's how much ground motion there is as the, as the volcano is essentially inflating, right? The other point I'd like to make about this, though, is that that inflation seems to stop. Right? It kind of comes down, gets a little smaller, a little smaller, and then stops. And you guys are like, yeah, okay, big deal. Well, it turns out uh, that it stops essentially right at one of those faults, and that fault is the same fault where we saw the uplift in 2021 start. So that fault that's in this location about halfway up seems to be a major kind of barrier for things happening to the north of that versus things that are happening to the south of that. And you guys are thinking to yourself still, all right, Steve, that sounds great, but you know, I want more than that from you. I, I mean, come on, really? Well, this is, this is the diagram that I think makes it a little more interesting, at least to me, maybe to you as well, hopefully. Uh, this is that same diagram from the HBO folks uh, with the whole series of yellow earthquakes and their uh, rainbow pattern from the INSAR image. And now I've tried to plot reasonably closely where our data points were from that. Um, and you can see that it matches reasonably well. Uh, but the big thing that I've also done on this is I've drawn these two nice big black lines to draw your attention. Um, and they're, they're, not, they're not drawn in other than just as a, as a black line to, to help me think about this. Uh, but basically, they are right at this series of faults where that same uplift in 2021 began. That's this area that's in this fault that's basically right there, okay? The other thing that happens, if you, if you look kind of closely at this, those, those yellow earthquakes come down and they get kind of offset to the left or to the west when they hit that fault. Well, why are those earthquakes there? They're there because that might be the place where the magma's moving. And this is a little, there, there are some that are, look a little better than this, but that's okay. Uh, and then those earthquakes come down to the south, and then they hit the poly that, it, that is the southern boundary of the Kauai fault system. And they basically stop. There are a few that are further to the south of that. But in general, that seems to be the barrier. So we seem to have the earthquakes come down. They get deflected by that, that fault that's in the middle. And then they come down, and they basically end up running into the, the southern bounding fault. So these faults appear to, to deflect and change and tell us where uh, that magma is going to move under the ground. So not only do the faults stop the, the lava from flowing across the surface to get down here, but they also kind of prevent the magma from getting out into that area where all these faults are. So where all those old lava flows are is also a place where we're not really injecting new magma, so it would be harder to have some sort of a lava flow. Our colleagues at, uh, at the University of Geneva have very nicely named this the unnamed poly because it does not have a name. It's this one in the middle. But it seems to be affecting what's going on um, a lot uh, in the center part of the, of the system. So what's going on today? Well, maybe not today, in the last week or so. So this is the, this is the new map um, showing some of the unrest. And things have changed a little bit. But again, I think the same basic setup exists. Here are a whole series of, of um, earthquakes, all these yellow things. I don't have a good one. We're going to have to do this again. All these guys coming down the, the, from the south caldera. The faults don't show up on this diagram so well, but that's okay. I know where they are, and part of the reason why I know where they are is because I see that break right there. That's where our fault is. And then the southern boundary, boundary fault is right in there, and that's where those earthquakes die when they come down uh, to the bottom. The, the change now 
uh, is that we've also got a set of earthquakes that are going down the East Rift connector over there as well. So there's probably magma moving under the ground over there as well. So one of the things I would like to do, mark your calendars, uh, is we're going to go back out and try to measure some of those locations that are out by the area in here. There are some places that we measured right before all this stuff started in October, which was great. Uh, and we want to go out and measure those again in January, or maybe February. January's running out pretty quickly here. Um, and see what, we're, what we've got going on. One of those permanent GPS stations is right out by the turnoff on the Helena Poly Road, which is out there on the right. So it's obviously had a lot of uplift in the last, in the last couple months. Um, on this diagram as well, right, are the historic lava flows. Drew Downs is going to talk about some of the southwest rift zone earth, uh, eruptions next week, next Tuesday night, um, and then some of these other eruptions out here off to the left. But here is this area that's protected kind of in the middle um, uh, of, of our diagram in there, okay? So the other thing, I guess, just to, just to point out is, is if, uh, you know, this is, this, is not, uh, this is not news necessarily, right? This is from the most, I think, most recent Volcano Watch article, um, which is where magma gets stored uh, at Kilauea. And so there's kind of two things here. There's a nice cross section um, and then also a, a, a map view of this, and so there's some storage of magma, you know, in a shallow magma chamber right under the caldera. There's some in the south caldera, which is that SD value, right? Um, there are uh, places in the southwest drift zone and the east drift zone uh, that have some of this material. But I think it's being guided by some of these faults that exist to the south of the caldera, right? So what does that mean for us? Well, you might, you might think, well, well, do we have eruptions? Why don't we have eruptions in this fault system? And I think it's because the, the magma really doesn't get there. It goes out on either side. There, are, there is one small uh, eruption that Don Swanson found. Um, he thinks it might be from the early 1800s, just a little scoria deposit out there that kind of popped out one of these one of these fractures. Um, also in 1973, he thinks that along the strike of the fault coming in from out on the east, east drift zone, uh, magma ma basically injected into the, along the fault, uh, into the Kauai fault system. But it didn't erupt, right? So we don't really expect an eruption there. We don't expect an eruption there. So where do we expect an eruption? Maybe along the East Rift Zone somewhere. Um, so again, these, these, are, these are not labeled by their names. The Pu'u'o'o eruption is all of that large lava field. The Mauna Ulu lava field is the brown one that's next to that to the left. And then some of these things we've been talking about, small eruptions and up in the caldera, um, up near the, near the summit. Um, could we have an eruption in the southwest drift zone? Yeah, certainly. Um, certainly we could have more eruptions in the caldera. Um, but then I think the other question is, and again, we're, we're kind of used, I think most of us at least, uh, are used to, you know, this eruption went on for 35 years out on the east drift zone. That seemed normal maybe to us, and I don't think it is. So are we going to have that, or are we going to have a series of kind of short-lived eruptions that are jumping around all over the place? I hope you weren't looking for answers to those questions. <laughs> if, we've war if we've learned one thing, it's Madam Pele does not like to let us know what she's going to do next, right? And so, but I, th I think one of the things is that in the 60s and the 70s, which is a long time ago now, um, 
there were a bunch of short lived eruptions that were all over the place. And maybe we're going to go back into one of these episodes where we get an eruption in the summit, we get an eruption out on the southwest drift, we get an eruption someplace out on the east drift, we get an eruption close in one of these connectors, it kind of hops around. I think that will keep the folks that work up in the national park here quite busy because they'll have to figure out where things are going. Um, but, but maybe that's more what we're going to move into. Um, you know, I don't know. But, but those are the places that I think we could see eruptions. Um, but again, on this diagram, the place where we're probably not going to see eruptions uh, is in that nice protected zone um, south of the caldera for the reasons we've talked about, right? So again, it's a little bit of, you know, speculation on, on what's next. Uh, this activity on the southwest rift and the connector up there uh, is interesting, right? And we haven't had an eruption out there for 50 years or so. Uh, in some ways it would be nice. It's in the park. It's not going to run over anybody's house. It's not going to run over anybody's road. Um, might be quite spectacular looking. Uh, but, but we could have an eruption in any one of those different kinds of spots, right? And I think the, the way to track that is by looking at some of this ground, inf ground deformation information and earthquakes. But again, I'll just point out, right, that, that we think these faults are controlling things. There's our south bounding fault, and there's our unnamed poly that's kind of causing this offset across there like that, right? So that seems to be one of the things that's controlling this longer term pattern uh, of where we see those things. So we'd like to thank the, 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 the park for letting us do work up here uh, and for having, letting us have a talk up here. Uh, all the HBO staff are, who are fabulous and help us out so much. Um, there are, we mentioned a few specific uh, of our geology majors. I think all the folks in here have been out helping us work on things. There have been people for years who have been doing it as well. I seem to be able to continue to get them to come and go out on a hike. Uh, and it's great. Uh, the South Dakota School of Mines folks, when they run their field camp, they do some of these monitoring things as well. Um, and then I'll just give a little plug for our folks at, at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory who have a fantastic website, right? So much of the information that I got today, photo-wise, those images of the earthquakes, those images of where the lava flows are, all that stuff can all be found on their webpage in various places. So if you want to know what's going on, that's the place. Uh, the other thing that they do that is just spectacular uh, is come out with a series of these weekly Volcano Watch articles, um, which are on a variety of topics. Um, and, and they are often very uh, informative about either a specific eruption in the past or what's going on at the volcano um, or anything else. So this is just a spectacular resource I think we're really lucky and fortunate to be able to have that, uh, to be able to track our volcano. So with that, I'll say thanks a lot and take some questions if you have them, maybe. <laughs> How'd we do? Oh, talking too long. You can even remember to delete the questions for the folks on the live stream. I can. I talked for too long. I apologize. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yeah. And we've done a lot of activity that's over there. And that seems to be a little bit out of the normal area. And I know you said this is only back in there, but as a resident of Volcano and someone who doesn't live very far from that area, <laughs> um, I would like to have a little review, a little bit more of your opinion on what's going on in that area. Sure. Obviously, I know it's been a long time since anything major happened there, but right. Okay, so the question was, do you, do you need to be concerned about the earthquakes in Mauna Loa states and places that are a little bit kind of that direction on this well, map? And also the operations teams, teams are out 
Right. 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 Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not the expert on that one. Um, there was actually a good volcano. Exactly. I'm looking at Katie. There was a good Volcano Watch article about the earthquakes in the last couple of weeks. And it talked, I think, about that earthquake as well. And I'm going to get it wrong, so I'm not going to remember what that's related to. But I don't think it's related to this. So that's good news for you guys. How's that? <laughs> well, in other words, I don't, I don't think it's a vol I don't think it's magma moving down into, into Mauna Loa states. I think, because there are other reasons why we get earthquakes on the big island. Well, I understand that, but also we do have some, some ocean waves around Oh, yeah. Yes, you do. So it's not like Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I'm not trying to dismiss the fact that it could happen, but I, but I think, I'm tr I, again, I'm trying to remember when I read through that stuff what people attributed that earthquake to, and I don't remember what it was. If it was loading of the crust. There's a line not too far from there based on the behavior patterns, which is where it has the worst Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so that's going, that's going down to the East Rift, right? So that's the path that the magma takes when it goes out and then goes out along the East Rift like it did to Pu'u. Oh. Uh, you know, I, you know, <laughs> don't quote me on that. How's that for an answer? Yeah, but I don't, I, th I think that earthquake was related to something else. I think. No, don't do that. <laughs> Drew, you live there. I do live there. I'm not worried to back her up. Okay. There you go. I'll, I'll trust Drew. <laughs> Different caused earthquake, right, in, in there. Yeah. Doesn't mean that, you know. Others. You guys have been very patient. 